So we tell the story in this house, but like I said, it is um, not furnished because it is not Isaac Wiley's story, except how it relates to Josiah Henson. Okay, oh, come on in. We just started. So um, basically, I'm just gonna show you quickly. When Isaac Wiley had this property in the early 1800s, it was close to 400 acres. Here in 1863, when he died, this is how much acres he owned, about a little over 200 and some 70 acres. Um, and Old Georgetown Road is right here. It used to be called Georgetown Pike in when Isaac Wiley and Josiah Henson was here. And this is the property that Parks owns today, this little bit right here, okay, because it became the Lux Manor development, grew up around here and was built around here. And this is what we own today. Um, we are working to raise money. If we, if we yes, money. If we raise, um, <laughs> if we raise um, three million dollars, uh, two million dollars, then this, the county council will give us three million dollars toward a museum. And we are working very hard to make this into a museum because it is the only place in America that we know that Josiah Henson walked in that is still standing in this country. So that is why we are going to make this into a park. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Josiah Henson's life, okay? And um, how do we know about his life? Because in 1849, he wrote, a, he dictated the slave narrative. And so all the information of his story is in this book. So um, this is how we know it to be true. So he was born in 1789 in Port Tobacco in Charles County. His earliest memory is when he is three years old. And his parents were working in a field and the overseer, the man who was in charge of the enslaved workers, hit his mother. And his father came to his mother's defense and struck the white overseer. His father's punishment was to be whipped a hundred times on his back. He was tied to a post so that he could be whipped. And then his ear was cut off and nailed to the post. So Josiah's earliest memory is of the blood running down his father's face from the mutilation that was done to him. His father, after that, is sold further south and is never, never in touch with the family again. After that, the family goes to his mother's owner's plantation, a Dr. McPherson, nearby. And um, they were there for about two years. And Dr. McPherson liked to party, and one night he went out to a party on his horse, and he had too much to drink, and coming home on his horse, they were fording a stream, and he slipped off the horse and drowned. So even back then, drinking and driving is not a good thing. <laughs> so what happens is that now the family has to be sold off to um, pay his creditors and people he owed money to. Josiah was the youngest of six children. So his mother and his five brothers and sisters and he are put in chains and they're brought to a slave auction in Rockville. And he is five years old and he's standing next to his mother and he's watching as his brothers and sisters are sold off. And his mother is bought by the man that owns his house, Isaac Riley. And she begs him to please, sir, please can you buy my youngest son? Please, please can I just have one of my children? He kicks her down. She's crying out for Josiah, who was sold to another man named Adam Robb, who lives in Rockville. So he's five years old, he's separated from his family, put into a slave cabin with 40 other enslaved strangers who do not know him, do not care about him, they're too exhausted at the end of the day to care for him, and he becomes ill. So within a couple of weeks, there's a knock on this door, and it's Adam Robb with Josiah. And he says to Isaac Riley, you have the mother, I have this child, let's make a deal. He's very sick. But if he lives, you owe me horseshoeing services from your blacksmith shop. If he dies, you owe me nothing. 
And that's how Josiah Henson winds up here on the mighty plantation reunited with his mother. So of course, under his mother's care, he, um, he gets better. And uh, at the age of seven, he's put to work in the fields. He has to bring heavy water buckets to the enslaved workers. Um, he talks about the conditions living here, the enslaved quarters, that um, there was no wood floor, it was just mud, that there were cracks in it, and that the wind and the snow and the rain would come in, that there was no furniture, just rags thrown in the corner where they slept, and a hearth to, for heat and to cook. Um, at the age of 13, one of the enslaved um, workers has, he's a young man, William Bell, and he has figured out how to read and write. And he says to Josiah, I know how to read and write. I will teach you. Josiah says, what do I have to do? He says, well, you have to go into town, either Georgetown or Washington, get yourself a Webster spelling book, make yourself a pen and a little ink, and I will teach you how to write, read and write. So Josiah does that. And he's now in charge of Isaac Riley's horse at this point. He's 13. And he has the cap, and he's going to meet William Bell later, so he puts the speller book under his cap, and he's bringing the horse out to the front of the house, and the horse is a little frisky that morning, and he knocks off his cap, and out tumbles the spelling book. And Isaac Riley says, what's that? And Josiah says, it's a speller book, sir. Where'd you get it? I bought it in town, sir. With what? Well, I picked up some apples from the orchard and sold them. Isaac Riley had a very heavy walking stick and he starts beating Josiah around the head and the shoulders until he's knocked unconscious. A few days later, Josiah sees Isaac again and Isaac says, well, if I ever see you again trying to educate yourself, I will beat your brains out. And Josiah wrote later, I thought he almost did. Now what happened to William Bell? Well, the slave owners in the area got together and they decided that William Bell had to be sold further south because he was a threat. Even though in Maryland it was never against the law to educate your enslaved workers, it was not something that slave owners wanted to do. So that young man was sold further south out of the neighborhood. Okay. Just to, um, before we move into the next room, I just wanted to show you a little bit of the details of this room. This room is one of the original rooms in the house. The house was built in the early 1800s. So this is a slave owner's house. It's not like Tara from the movie Gone with the Wind. It's not one of those big, big type of Virginia or further south. This is a typical Chesapeake home of this time period. There were three rooms downstairs. There was um, two bedrooms upstairs. There are four fireplaces in the house, the original house. Okay. And the staircase would have been enclosed. It would not have had those rungs. It would have had just some closing, and it would have come further to the door. So as you walked in, it would have just been right from the door and up. Okay. Um, if you are interested in architecture of old buildings, um, we have that you can look at a piece of fiberglass up there. We have exposed the ceiling, so if you are interested in that, and also over here, so that you can see some of the original nails and things like that. So we have those, for those of you who are interested in that type of thing, there's a, um, so that you can look in. when they put in a new kitchen, a modern kitchen, and also they added a bedroom upstairs and put in the garden. 
electricity. So um, there were no more, longer outhouses or cribbies, okay? They brought it indoors. And we also had this colonial revival style. Colonial Williamsburg had just been built, and the range in interior design at that time was the colonial revival style. So here is a, a feature of that colonial revival style. So what's interesting is the houses on the um, side of historic preservation homes for the 1930 revival. Because it was done by an architect who had done the house. So these people had well in the 1930s. So we cannot change any of the features inside the house anyway. We can't bring it back to an 1800 plantation home because of it being on the historic registry for this remodeling. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so getting back to Josiah Hens' story. Um, he is here on the plantation, and when he's 18, his mother, um, his mother is a Christian. We don't know where she learned about Christianity, but she wants Josiah to become a Christian. So he gets permission from Isaac Riley to listen to yes. an abolitionist preacher. Um, and he goes there. He's not allowed in, but he stands at the back door, and he hears about a God who loves people, whether they are black or white, free or enslaved, rich or poor. His Christianity becomes a touchstone of his life as you listen to the rest of his story, you will hear what I mean. When he's 20, he marries, and I put those little air quotes, because of course enslaved people were not allowed to legally marry, um, a, a woman named Charlotte from a native plantation. And she comes here and lives with him. And at the age of 22, Josiah is made the overseer here on the plantation. Isaac Riley is not a very good businessman, and he, um, his white overseer is stealing from him. And Isaac does find out, so he fires really? the white overseer and hires Josiah. Um, and of course, one of the benefits to that is he had to pay his white overseer, he does not have to pay Josiah. But Josiah and Charlotte move into the overseer's cabin. And we can, can tell from other historical places that the overseer's cabin would have been pretty close to the house since they had business with the owner. So we are, when we do our archaeological digs, we are looking for features that might lead us to the overseer's cabin, and that is one place we know where Josiah Henson was. Okay? And it's, here's something interesting. As part of his yeah. description of being the overseer is whenever Isaac Riley would go into Rockville to play cards, which he did just about every yeah. weekend, Josiah went along as his bodyguard, because in a lot of times there were fights between the gentlemen who were playing cards. Um, Isaac cheated, and so one night when they were playing cards, Isaac is called out for cheating at cards, and um, the man who refuses him, his bodyguard, who was white, now gets into a fight with Josiah, who was protecting Isaac. And so the two men hit each other. The white overseer is in a neighboring plantation. About two weeks later, sees Josiah on a horse. And he gets three of his enslaved workers, and they attack Josiah. And it's four against one. Josiah is a big man. He picks up a fight. But then one of the men gets his post, and they break both his shoulder blades and his collarbone. And um, the horse comes back without him here to the Riley Plantation. They go looking for him, and they find him no doctor's bill. But for the rest of his life, because of his injury to his body, he can no longer raise his arms above his head. So in order to take off his hat, he has to go like this. And so it's something that he has to visit for the rest of his life from that being. Okay. All right, let's move on into the next room. This is, I believe, um, the kitchen, the original kitchen, and the door was here where the window was. goes to the um, overseer's cabin door and goes in and sits down with Josiah and he says to Josiah, Josiah, I'm in trouble, I need your help. Yes, master, what can I do? 
He says, well, I owe people money. And they're going to come and they're going to take my slaves and sell them out from under me. Now, besides the property, enslaved people had the most value that a slave owner had. And he did not want these slaves to be sold out from under him. So he says to Josiah, I want you to take all the slaves here except your mother and go to my, cut, my brother Amos's plantation in Kentucky over here. It's 700 miles and it's February. And Josiah says, Nasa, I don't know how to get to Kentucky. He says, Si, if you don't do it, I will just sell all the slaves further south away from their families. Yes, Nasa, I will figure out a way to get to Kentucky. So he, his two children, Charlotte, and 20 other enslaved workers, in February, one night, have to leave under cover of darkness because basically they're stealing away, right? And they have a horse at a park and some supplies and a pass, a permission pass to travel. And they head out to Kentucky. It's February, it's 700 miles. Now, it's 1825. In this time period, we have free states and slave states in this country, right? Maryland is a slave state. And as they're traveling, they get to Ohio. Ohio is a free state. All the free blacks there say to Josiah, stay here. You're free now. All of you are free. And he thinks about it, and he says no. He says, I never thought about running away. I always thought about buying my freedom. He said, and also perhaps he wondered about what would happen to his mother, who was left behind here. So they don't stay in Ohio. They continue to Kentucky, to Amos' plantation. Within a year, all of the enslaved workers that came with Josiah were sold from the south, except for Josiah, Charlotte, and his children, where he is actually made the overseer on Amos's plantation. He is a trustworthy, responsible man, and he is made the overseer there. About two years later, he says to Amos, I would like to go back to Maryland. I want to buy my freedom from Isaac. So the two brothers write letters back and forth, and it's agreed, yes, that he can travel, and that he can go to talk to Isaac. Now, as he's traveling in Ohio, he meets an abolitionist preacher, and this preacher says to him, you are a wonderful speaker. Now, he can't read or write to Sia yet, but he's memorized large parts of the Bible. And so he, he speaks, he preaches, and they do a second offering to raise money for him to buy his freedom. Kind of like a GoFundMe. And that's what they're doing. So he spends months in Ohio raising this money. So by the time he comes back here, he has a nice horse, $250 in his pocket, and a nice set of clothes. And he's here to talk to Isaac about getting his freedom, buying his freedom. So Isaac looks, takes one look at him, sees how nicely he's dressed, and says to him, you sleep on the floor of the kitchen tonight. The kitchen was the dirtiest place in the plantation. But Isaac just had to kind of, look, they were going to negotiate, you know? So they do. They negotiate. And he says to him, here's your price, $450. Now, in those days, $1 equals $25 of our own money today. Just to give you an idea of how much value enslaved workers were. So $450. He says to Isaac, I have $250 cash. He sells his horse for $100. So now he has $350. He, he's $100 short. So he says to Isaac, this is what I'll do. I will go back to Amos. I will raise the $100 preaching. I will give the money to Amos. He will mail it to you. And then you mail me my freedom papers. It's a deal. And that's what he does. He has the hundred dollars, he gets back to Amos, he sees Charlotte, he goes, Charlotte, Charlotte, I have the hundred dollars to buy my freedom. She goes, oh no, sign. I heard Master Amos say it was a thousand dollars you was your price. So now he owes five hundred and fifty dollars. They cheated him, they stole money from him, and he says to Amos, will you pay me for my work so I can raise the money? No, son, you're a slave. About a year later, Amos says to him, I want you to go to New Orleans with my son, Amos Jr. I have business down there. I want you to go. So they're on the Mississippi River on their way to New Orleans. And it's Josiah, Amos Jr., who's about in his early 20s, the captain of the boat, and two other white people, men on the boat. The captain 
comes down with temporary river blindness. Temporary river blindness, which is caused by the glare of the sun on the water into the captain's eyes before people have sunglasses. So he's not blind permanently, but he has to stay out of the sun. So they all have to take turns driving, steering the boat and driving the boat. And one night they say to Sai, Josiah, we're going to sleep, you take the boat. So he's steering the boat and driving the boat, but he's thinking to himself, I know what's going to happen in New Orleans. I'm going to get sold. And nobody wants to get sold in New Orleans. So he's trying to think, how can I not have this happen? And he sees an ax in the corner of the boat. He says to himself, the only way that I'm not going to get sold in New Orleans if I pick up that ax and I kill the people on this boat. So he picks up the ax and he's about to bring it down on Amos Jr. And all of a sudden, a verse from the Bible comes in his head. Does anybody want to take a guess? What does the Bible say about killing other people? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. And that's what's in his head. And he puts the ax down. And he says, I can't do this. I'm a Christian. I can't do it. But there's also another saying. I don't know if it's in the Bible, but we say it. God works in mysterious ways. They get to New Orleans. Amos Jr. comes down with yellow fever. He doesn't know a soul in New Orleans except Josiah, and he's really sick. And he says to Josiah, stay with me, nurse me, help me, I'm so sick. He says, I was supposed to sell you here in New Orleans, but I'm too sick. And so Josiah stays with him, and he gets well, and he says to Josiah, I can't sell you. You're the reason why I'm alive today. And they go back to Kentucky, and he says to his father, I couldn't sell him yet. He's the reason I'm alive today. Well, Josiah says to Charlotte, I'm not waiting for them to sell me again. We're out of here. She doesn't want to go. He says, we're leaving. He has four children at this time. It's 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, four boys, and two boys that are two and three years old. So he says to Charlotte, this is what I need you to do. I need you to take some hemp or burlap and make me two bags. And he puts the two-year-old in one and the three-year-old in the other. He puts them on his shoulders. Remember the broken bones? And he practices for two weeks how he can walk with these boys on his back. And they start off on the Underground Railroad, okay, which, as you know, was not a real train underground. Okay? It was secret places, secret trails, people along the way who were against slavery, who helped runaways. Josiah does not want to stay in the United States. He wants to go to Canada. He doesn't trust this free slave state, slave state. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to get to Canada. So they leave in September, and it takes them six weeks on the Underground Railroad. And it's really interesting when you read about the different ways that people help them, Quakers, Native Americans, people along the way that help them. And they get to New York where I'm from, which is my accent, which you've been hearing. <laughs> and um, they get to Buffalo, and from there, a captain brings them across into Canada. And now they're free. They're in Canada. But when he gets to Canada, he realizes that even though slavery has been abolished in Canada, there is still racism, there are still problems for the fugitives in the United States coming there. So he starts writing, well, he can't write. He starts, he still can't write at this point, read or write. Um, he starts talking um, to people coming down to Pennsylvania, Ohio, and talking to people about getting <coughs> land in Canada. And they raise money and they buy land in Dresden, Ontario. And on this property, they build a school, they build housing, they build a sawmill, so that the runaway slaves from the United States have a place to go. And he calls it Dawn, a new day. Over 600 fugitives from America lined up in Dawn. In Canada, at Dawn, there is a huge museum to Josiah Henson. Josiah Henson is called the Frederick Douglass of Canada. He's the first person of color to be on the Canadian postage stamp. So this is why we are trying so hard to raise money to make this into a museum here, because there is no other museum in America to Josiah Henson. The only museum is in Canada. Um, so to get on with his story, so he's up there. In 1849, he wants to get his brother John's freedom. His brother is still enslaved in Rockville. So he dictates his story, and it's published. And it's a slave narrative, which had become popular at the time. His slave narrative is published. He gets the money to buy his brother John's freedom. 
But an 18, but a woman, an author named Harriet Beecher Stowe, also has read his slave narrative. She has just lost her youngest son, Charles, who was five years old, to one of those diseases that would come in and just take five-year-old children from the whole community. And she's reading in Josiah's narrative, slave narrative, about the slave auction and how Mrs. Henson loses all her children. And she just starts crying because she feels the pain. And she puts down his book and says, I must write a book that tells about the evils of slavery. And she does. She writes a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now this book is second only in sales to the Bible. It's the Harry Potter of its time. Everybody is reading this book. And it does tell the evils of slavery. But the people in the South who own slaves say it's all lies. All lies. She made it up. So in 1853, she comes out with another book called The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And in that book, she names real slaves, real enslaved people that she, whose stories she modeled the characters on in her book. And in that book, she names Josiah Henson as the model for the character Uncle Tom, who was the most beloved character in her book. Now, imagine J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter. She was standing here today, and she had a 12-year-old boy next to her. And she said to everybody, this is the boy that I modeled Harry Potter on. Wouldn't you want to know about that kid? You'd want to know all about him, right? Well, that's the way the world felt about Josiah Henson. They wanted to know who was this Uncle Tom? Who was this man? So he starts... Um, giving tours and speeches to raise money for Dawn about being Uncle Tom. By this point, he has learned to read and write. His brother, his son has taught him. And um, he writes at least three more autobiographies of his life and um, goes around giving speeches. He even becomes a conductor on the Underground Railroad himself. He brings 113 people back to um, Canada from the United States. And in 1877, um, he also goes to England. He meets Queen Victoria. And what's interesting is, is when President and Mrs. Obama went to meet Queen Elizabeth, it seems that the Queen always goes into her archives and pulls out something to show the visiting dignitaries as a connection between her country and theirs. And she took out the picture of um, Queen Victoria and Josiah Henson wow. and showed it to the President wow. as a connection. So yeah, so that was really interesting. So, um, so in 1877, he is invited to the White House. It's after the Civil War. President Rutherford B. Hayes is in the White House. And he and his second wife, Charlotte, they were married for 40 years. They had 12 children, eight who survived to adulthood. Um, she passes, and he marries a woman from Baltimore named Nancy. She goes up to live with him in Canada. But they're invited to the White House. And they go and they visit the president. And then he says to um, Nancy, I want to go back to the old Riley plantation. I want to visit my mother's grave. Because his mother had died from the time that he was in Kentucky. When he comes back to buy his freedom, she has passed. So he wants to visit her grave one more time. He's now in his early 90s. He lived to be 93. So he, they come here, and the, he can't believe the plantation, what it looks like. It's all run down. This is no more slaves to work. It, um, yes, my time? Yeah. Okay, okay. So anyway, um, as he's um, he's here, he comes in, and Matilda Riley is still alive. Isaac doesn't marry until he's 45. He marries an 18-year-old. So she, she's still alive. She's in her 70s. And she's laying right in that first room where we came in. And she's in her 70s, and she says, Sai, is that you? Come closer. And he's just been to see the president. He's in his Sunday best clothes. And she looks him up and down and she says, Why, Sai, you're a gentleman now. And he says to her, I always was. I always was. <laughs> and he lived to be 92 years old. Okay, so I am now going to take you into the log cabin kitchen for the next part of the tour. So please go in. And it will be our archaeologist volunteers who will talk to you about the kitchen. So you're welcome. And, and we have the book to sell. It's $10. Yes. We're going to go in the kitchen. Okay. Yes. in the kitchen, the kitchen. Oh, okay. All righty. <laughs> so, the life of Josiah Henson, formerly a slave, narrated by himself. 
and Uncle Tom's Cannon with Harriet Beecher Stowe. These are his journeys. Outside to look at some of the archaeology that's going on in the uh, backyard. My name is Don. I'm a uh, uh, volunteer with Parks Archaeology, and the person who will be showing around some of the artifacts, uh, Paul, is also a, a volunteer doing archaeology on the site. As you heard from the story, uh, Josiah Henson wrote his autobiography, and we know an awful lot about the site. And one of the things that he mentions in his autobiography is that there is an out kitchen on the site. And so it would certainly appear from looking around that this certainly looks like it could be an out kitchen. And for the community, the Lux Manor community, for all these years, this was in fact the Josiah Henson Uncle Tom's cabin. Right? That's what everyone had thought. Because if you take a look at this structure and compare it to the next structure, this one has to be older. Well, it turns out that when the Parks bought the property, they wanted to solve the mystery. Because all along there was some controversy about what was the age of this. And I don't know how uh, attuned you are to how we may do dating in archaeology with uh, surviving structures. The parks hired somebody to do testing on this particular building. Anybody know what that testing now. might include? How could you figure out the age of this particular cabin? a core from the Carbon. Take a, a core from the, the wall, yeah. from the logs themselves. And in, in fact, that's absolutely right because there is a small little one back yeah. here. There is one over there. There. Um, okay. There's one right behind here. Not older, that's a... yeah. And they took a core sampling of the logs uh, to see when the logs had been cut down. The term is dendrochronology, which is a very long word for saying the age of wood. And when the report came back, and this is the, some of the, how you would do the core sampling, when the report came back, they discovered that uh, the logs that made this particular building had been cut down in 1850. Is that a good date for Josiah Henson to be on the property? No. No. Why not? Because he left before them. Didn't he? He, left, he left before them. In fact, he was in Canada in 1830, but this was built in 1850. The other thing that people were taking literally <clears throat> is Josiah Henson when he said that there was an out kitchen. This kitchen is attached to the building. And so some say, well, this couldn't have been it anyway because an outbuilding should be separated like they did in the early 1800s. <coughs> and why, do you, why did they separate their kitchen from their house? So, why would um, so like, the, like in case the kitchen caught on fire, then the fire wouldn't pass too bad. Because, uh, yeah. And yes. they made it out of log because it could easily be covered uh, again. Yeah. Because, I mean, we have kitchens that catch on fire if, it's, if the chimney itself is not tended to, and that way the kitchen would burn down, but not the house. What other reason why you would detach? You wouldn't want the heat from the kitchen to get into the house the, in the summertime. Right. The heat, and what else didn't you want into the house that was being done in the kitchen? Vermin fumes. Yeah, the, oh, the fumes and the, the smell of cooking. I mean, we cook by going to the store and getting the meat already processed. They were butchering on the site. They were doing the things, taking the feathers off of the chicken. And all that kind of stuff would, would sort of smell. And the other reason, especially in slave states, 
is you would have a separation between where, in this case, Isaac Riley lived and where the enslaved people did their work. And so you would not have it you know, to be able to do what you just did. And in fact, in 1850, when this cabin was built, or 1851, that door did not exist. There was no entry in and out of this particular cabin. The door is actually where you're standing, where the window is. And um, when you go outside, and Paul takes you outside to the archaeological sites outside, you can see that this window had been put in and that the logs had been cut for a door. So in 1850, Matilda Riley, who was alive, Isaac Riley had died in 1850. I don't know if Matilda built this new kitchen to celebrate the death of her husband. I don't know. Or that <laughs> she finally got a new kitchen that, uh, that uh, his, you know, Isaac didn't want to build at all. But uh, there were still slaves on the property. There were a handful of them. And so this, even though this isn't the Henson building, it is still interpreted as a slave cabin. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let me try to clear up that controversy. It's still in, interpreted as a slave cabin? Yes. Slaves, we knew that we were probably... Because they lived in the kitchen when they worked. Yes. Okay, got it. And in, in 1850, there was a very small number on the, the site, but most likely the work that was being done uh, for Matilda and any of her children would have been done by enslaved people probably working in, in, the, in the kitchen area. Okay. So that would have, this would have been stayed a slave cabin from 1850 to when Maryland frees slaves in 1864. So, um, and, then, and then in the 1930s, this was changed. When uh, the addition was put on to the house, the porch was put on, this door was put in, this is the paneling for the cabin as the Boltons who lived here and did the, the um, colonial revival of the house, certainly didn't want to show this. They put in this nice whatever paneling it is. They made this window instead of a door. We're not sure when this door was put in. Uh, it probably was not at the time of 1850. They would have had one door, one window. And they also put in what you're standing on, this wooden floor. This wooden floor is from the 1930s. And they also raised the chimney where I'm standing has been raised. This is 1930s. This is the original chimney from 1850 and this is its configuration but it would have been lower. So it was raised up. So in the 1930s when uh, the Boltons moved in, they decided that they would uh, seal this and put in a wooden floor. We didn't know quite what that looked like until a TV program out of Oregon called Time Team America in 2012. And there's their emblem. I think I have a baseball cap that has that emblem on it. It uh, came to this site as part of a reality archaeology show in 2012. That this was their second season of coming uh, to sites in North America, and the second season only had four programs, and they chose to come here because of the compelling story of Josiah Henson, because they knew that the archaeology in this area is unusual to do archaeology in a suburban development with McMansion swimming pools, traffic everything else you know might be sort of intriguing as to can you still find archaeologically stuff that hadn't been here for an awful long time so uh, as part of the deal the park said to make the program really exciting nobody would know what what's happening they were they decided that they would take up the wooden floor and this is the way it looked like before it was just entirely wooden and the parks wasn't going to touch it, but they said, for this TV show, 
we will cut out a section of it and we'll cut out this particular section. And lo and behold, we found what we expected to find that is a dirt floor. And this is the dirt floor. On top of the dirt floor, some of you may be able to see uh, over here, by, by pointer, there is a very thin piece of concrete that sort of sealed the dirt floor. And there's some of it over here that you can see. We knew that there was a cement floor, but we didn't know whether or not Time Team American would have to bring in jackhammers or whether a trowel would do it. And so when this was removed, turned out that it could easily be broken up and very quickly comes the dirt floor. And we also discovered that underneath the concrete, this layer, which you can sometimes, you can see it maybe extending over here, the really red dirt, was fill dirt that was put over the, the original kitchen dirt floor, cement, there's a space in between, and then this wooden floor. So the TV show, three days they are here. They're only going to be here for three days, whatever they can find in three days. The fourth day they're gone, and they were gone after three days. So for some dramatic purpose, the producer decided they should do tackle this Wednesday, the third day, in the afternoon. I guess to give it some kind of, you know, you're sitting on the edge of your chair, thinking of, you know, the clock is counting down, are they going to find anything? Well, you know, uh, we didn't know if that was really the right approach, but that's what happened. And they took off, took, in the morning the carpenters came and got rid of the uh, wooden floor and revealed this, uh, uh, this concrete. This beam is not old. It looks more like 1970s, and it made sense because right here where you see this little berm, there was a, a duct, a heating and air conditioning duct. And it goes with, the, I mean, you can see right behind you, and we also knew that over here was part of an air conditioning system. So that sat right here, and it sort of uh, was a way of dividing the way they did this into four units. So there were four archaeologists in these units, and they were told, you know, excavate in the same manner you would, but time is moving, so do as much as you can. And as they were doing it, they came across artifacts. What you see here represents the different activities that we have found based upon the excavation. These are not the real artifacts. We wouldn't leave them here like this, but they represent the kinds of things that we found. If, you, if I draw your attention over here, we found what is represented here. Eggshells. And they weren't as big as this, and Paul has that you can pass around. We found very small little eggshells. And I didn't realize that eggshells just don't go away. Oh. Basically pull them out of the screen. You can pull them out of the screen. And when you look at them, you, you, most people have said that we're finding them said, I've seen this somewhere before. And you feel it and it's an eggshell and part of the eggshell. I don't know how many eggs are represented by that, maybe a half of an egg but there was lots of eggshells. And in that case that's being passed around, there are, there's a pig's tooth, there's a cut bone. So uh, we expected to find that. This is supposed to be a kitchen. And so we use this for uh, interpretive purposes to show uh, that there was food processing going on. We also found um, ceramics uh, in the kitchen. And it made sense that you would do that. But what was kind of interesting is that if you look at these ceramics, which are supposed to represent what we find, there's two different sort of status of the dishes. Can you see what I mean by the social status of the dishes? 
lot of designs on one lot of, set. A lot of designs here on this particular ones, but then what about the others? The, the, it looks like it's one is finer china and the other one is like a porcelain. Or yeah, these are these look much finer. Um, these very plain. Very plain. And so, what do I mean? Do you think by the social status of the ceramics? Like how rich the person was. Yeah. And so, who is using these? The lady of the house. The lady of the house. These are the dishes that would be used to serve the food to the Rileys. They are the master and the mistress. These would represent what status? Like, I guess, below the rich. And would be used by the enslaved people, the enslaved yes. people who are fixing the meal. Probably very utilitarian kinds of dishes to create the meals, but then it would be put on to a higher status. So that was kind of interesting in finding that range of ceramics. We also found in this particular corner and also in other places outside, we found these things. Oh, I thought they were mothballs. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Are you smelling mothball stuff? <laughs> I wanted to put serving. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I mean, certainly, I was going to ask the kids if they recognize these things. Do you recognize what these yeah. might be? We could pass one around. Oh, Again, it's a representative. What are they? Marbles. They're marbles. And who uses marbles? The children. So, what's going on? You have marbles in the kitchen. They could have been playing games. They're probably playing games. The same woman who is cooking the meal and preparing the dishes is also tending to the kids. Maybe 150 years from now, when we excavate somebody's kitchen, we'll find an iPad mini <laughs> in the corner, and people will say, or a, or a phone like what you may have. You send the kids while you're doing the meals to the corner to <laughs> occupy themselves. This is the corner, and this is what they were occupied with. And it's interesting, way out back where we think we're, we have another dwelling, we have also found marbles. So it seems to be the game of choice on this particular property. But the kids also worked in the kitchen, too. They, yes. I, didn't Frederick Douglass was in his first job to clean out the fireplace Probably when he was Probably they would do that too. And then during the downtime, they could go back to, maybe it yeah. was clean this out, then you can play with the marble. Yeah. The other item that we found is located here. And I bet another age group knows exactly what this is. <laughs> This is I'm too young. I'm too young. <laughs> Way too Me too. I, I never used one of these. This I is one where you put the coal inside. I don't well, think I put the coal in. This is this <laughs> is a sad iron. That's the problem. It's really heavy, so be careful. Don't step on it. Don't drop it on your foot. And I think it's called a sad iron because of it's made out of metal. But if you were had to do ironing all day, I think you would be very sad because it is extremely heavy. We didn't find it complete. Uh, Paul actually has a picture of how it was found. So the handle was missing. We never found the handle in doing the excavation. It may still be somewhere in where we have not been able to excavate. But it was kind of, sort of an interesting clue that there was one other activity going on in this building. And that it meant that um, the lady who was here cooking the food, tending the kids, preparing the dishes, in her spare time was ironing. We had it conserved. My hold this, on to it here, it's really heavy. So. And this is the conservation that was done in the Maryland Archaeology Conservation Lab. Uh, so that it would not rust and turn to a bunch of just rust. 
dust. So, dust or whatever, rust dust or something. Um, we also suspect that um, that this was the kind of cloth, this, the linen cloth, that probably Isaac Riley's shirts were made out of, and then this is what would be ironed. This is material, very much burlapish, would have been the clothing for the enslaved people. And I'll just pass and you can sort of see. You would not iron this. You would iron this. And I'm pretty sure that uh, you know that this would have to be heated. And then you do this. And if it turns out you do this. Oops, <laughs> I've done that before. Yes, and you have now Isaac Riley has on his shirt an iron bird print. And I guess he would not be, he would not be very happy. One of the things that also happened on the last day that we can come back to the date of this building is that one of the archaeologists who was sitting in this unit here um, decided that it would be kind of interesting to see how deep he could go with the producer saying, work faster, work faster, we're losing light. And he said, well, it's hard to excavate all of this and do the paperwork and keep up he decided that he was going to take a one foot by one foot square, which now has been widened by parks archaeologist Cassandra Michaud, who is outside. But he took a one foot and just went really deep. And when he went really deep, he noticed the different floors that are related to this particular spot. If I can show you, and I can only show on this side because my pointer, I can't go the other way, but you might see the top is the concrete. This red is fill dirt, the good old Maryland red clay. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, underneath of it, it gets a little lighter and has a yellow look. So this was probably the top of the dirt floor in the 1930s when the Boltons sealed this. And then underneath of it is a very dark layer that is ashy in color. Ashy from this, probably ashes that are taken out. And then underneath of it is another color of a dirt floor. This would separate it, so there's two. And then he got down in this one by one foot to a yellow color, which is very different from this. So he had opened up three different dirt floors. And as it, uh, and I think you may, may know or may not know that dirt floors were cleaned every seven to 10 years. And they are clean so that uh, there are ruts that, that take place. So a dirt floor isn't just bringing in dirt and stomping it down. You would prepare it. And you might prepare it with uh, lime mixed with clay, mixed with water, mixed with manure, throw in some horse hair and make a slurry and then spread it over the top and let it sit for a couple of weeks. That's one recipe. You can have your own recipe for how to do it. Uh, but we think that's what's happening here, that they are cleaning and the color. And at the very bottom, and we still could go down some further, Cassandra opened it up wider to show the yellow, which probably extends throughout the entire floor. We don't know what might be underneath of it. But what was kind of interesting is that the person who was working here is the same man who did the Denver chronology. And he thought that this floor, his hypothesis was, which we are still trying to figure out, he sort of thinks that this floor does not go with this cabin, that it's too low in the ground based upon where the logs are. So what we... And I can't say for sure. I can't, you know, have a news conference to tell you we found where another building what might be. But we are sort of 
thinking that maybe the more we excavate this, there may have been a previous building on the site. And the thinking is, could it have been the out kitchen that Josiah Henson would have known that his mother, I guess it was his mother who was the cook here, might have been not this structure, but here. Is it close to the house? Yeah. You don't want an out kitchen all the way over here. You want it close by. So that's what we're still working on. Um, before I send you outside, because we're still, uh, uh, if you'd like to go outside, we are still looking for uh, outbuildings out in the backyard. And there are several units that are open uh, for you to look and talk to park archaeologists. Do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? We're going to go out that door over there. We're going to go out this door if you want. But if you have any questions or if you want to escape to the outside. Thank you. Thank you. For okay, why don't you all come with me? Okay. Paul will show you how to, yep. how to get there. Thank you so much. Pass that back in there. Thank you. I'll do the iron while you're going. We're going to go off to the left. I think I'm good. I don't know. Yeah, I might have to do that. Oh, we can do that. I mean, it doesn't matter. Actually, a unit we had open earlier this week, but we've now closed up. Oh, we're going to go around the side over here. Oh. One thing you notice, we walk around the building, you see how, how, how high up the old Georgetown Road, road is? Probably when this house was built, the Georgetown Road would have been even or even this house might have been sitting on a hill overlooking the road. So this is kind of the effect that people have on the topography and on the uh, landscape as, as time goes on, because now it's way built up. So as you walk by, you can notice where the logs are a little different, probably again, an indication that there was probably a building uh, at one point. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to, these guys are working here. I think I spoke with some of you earlier, but I'll go ahead and, and sort of review again. Um, so, we're here to try and figure out what the landscape of this plantation would have looked like in, when Josiah Henson was here and what's happened since then. Because if you look around you, this landscape is not what the slaves or Ivan Riley or Josiah Henson would have experienced. It would have been farmland. There would have been a series of outbuildings around here, around the main house, outbuildings, and then there would have been farm fields and farm roads and other kinds of dependencies. And so obviously that's not the case now, but we don't know where those are. So we need to, we don't have good historical documentation. Often on some of these plantation sites, you have maps, you have deeds, you have ledgers that give you indications. We don't have that for this site, so we do need to rely on archaeology to try and find traces of what's going on out here. And we've done some testing throughout this area, and we've uncovered upwards of 20,000 artifacts uh, across the whole property, um, and there's different areas where there are concentrations. And back in the very back of the property, is uh, underneath the tarps. We have not opened it up for today, but we found a concentration of domestic and construction material, which we think is uh, somebody was living in this in the slave quarters. It may have been the overseer. There was an overseer for this um, for this well, property. Yeah. And Isaac, uh, Josiah Henson eventually becomes the overseer of the property. So it might that might be what that residence is. And on the table over here, we have some of the artifacts that we that we've recovered from that property, from that uh, small area in the back. What these guys are doing is one of the other buildings, outbuildings we're looking for is the smokehouse. And it's explicitly mentioned in some fire insurance documents as being 20 paces from the house. So these units, these three units we've set up here are an attempt to try and locate the smokehouse uh, to help us understand the landscape 
we found some indication there's some, been some pig bones. Uh, the, the, the smokehouse is where they would have stored smoked meats, cured and smoked meats throughout the winter for to feed the family and everybody else. And usually it was pigs. And so we found some pig bones, which is very tantalizing, but we haven't found the actual location yet, so we're continuing to look. Um, so that's what these guys are doing. You guys are welcome to come see what they're doing. Uh, if you guys want to help screen, you're welcome to help screen. There's some gloves over there. Put their hands into the dirt. You're welcome to do that. Just be very careful uh, and, and ask the volunteers for guidance. Um, but other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have that weren't already covered in the house. Do you guys have any questions? And this artifact over here. Yeah. This was found. Uh, yeah. This is. Does anyone know what this is? Chamber pot. Chamber pot, right? So this is a perfect example of something you'd find in a domestic structure. You wouldn't necessarily find it in a stable or anything like that because you aren't, unless you were living in the stable, obviously. So it's a great indication that someone was living there. So what we found was all of, this isn't even all the pieces that we found. We found all these little pieces and we put them back together. And not only did we find all these little pieces, these came from five different five different units spread out over 20 feet and they came out of two different features and our feature is simply an area where someone has dug into the existing soil done something like build a foundation or a post hole and backfill it so that these pieces ended up in that so what that says to us is that this was already discarded on the ground when those features were dug and it was already spread out so Someone was there before that post hole was dug, and, and so we were able to find them all spread out. So we take the pieces and we put them back together to give us a better understanding of what happened, and not only while people were living there, but what happened after they were living there, and how we can reconstruct those behaviors. So yeah, so we this is part of what happens. The digging is the first step. Actually, the historical research is the first step. Digging is the second step. And then we go in the lab and we wash everything and we catalog everything and we track everything with, with numbers to know exactly how many artifacts we have, what they are, what their functions are. And then we start to try and put pieces back together so we can have a better sense of what happened out here. And so there's a whole pro they say, it's essentially for every day in the field, you get five days in the lab. So the lab is where all of the really fun things happen, even though everyone thinks of the field as where it, where it happened. Okay, I'm going to interrupt just a second. Yep. If you have not done the house tour, we're going to do a house tour now. So if you would like to come yeah. those. Yeah, uh, we'll be here afterwards. So we'll okay. see you after. House tour, and then you'll come back to the archaeologist. Who is your archaeologist? Who wanted he to might already be in. Okay. I'll send him in. Okay. So yeah, so we have, and so you can see some of the other artifacts. Um, this is the bridle. This is what it looked like when we found it. It's corroded. It looked chunky and big and this is after we had it conserved it looks like this you can see all the fine detail of it there's a double bridle that they would have used either for driving a horse or for riding it could have been used for either but this piece is actually a strap hinge right so a strap hinge to hold the door in place this is an example of what it looked like when it isn't rusted so strap it obviously these are this is hardware for for some kind of structure um, and so just to give a sense these are, this is an example of one of the features, like a foundation feature. And then this is like a, is a post hole, a very large post hole. Uh, you can, do you want to go tell him? And then this is sort of a, an example of what we think might have looked, what that house might have looked like. Very simple structure. There may have been a porch that would have extended out front um, and would have just been one room with a loft probably, or one and a half stories. We're not talking about a big structure. Um, and Henson's autobiography, he talks, talks about how the wind whistles through the cracks and they slept on dirt floors and it was not a, it's not a glamorous environment at all. Um, so there you go. So that's some of the artifacts we were finding. Do you guys have any other questions? Let's see, what else do we have here? Have you done any other objects? Like, have you excavated any other objects? Yeah, so we actually have almost 20,000 artifacts. Wow. Like, that's a lot of artifacts. So this is just a small, small sample. And if you walk into the back door there, into this, what we call the new kitchen, that new kitchen has a small display of some of the other artifacts that we found that span the entire period, including prehistoric artifacts, to modern day, a 1970s little barrette fell on the ground from someone who must have lived here in the 70s. 
so yeah, we found 20,000 artifacts. And so our goal is to try and figure out where and how old they are. Because the, the property has a history that goes back at least 200 years. And so our job is to kind of to tell that whole story, not just to look at one little piece. Though the part we care about most is Henson's story. Because that is such a unique part of the past here. And in most of Montgomery County, it has been lost. Most of it's been developed. We don't have the wonderful sort of fortuitous opportunity to hear from the person who actually was enslaved. And that's the wonderful thing about Henson's story is he tells his own story about what it was like to live at this exact spot. He was here. He was walking through these houses. As the overseer, he would have been in the house talking to Riley. He would have he came back and visited it. He would have been managing this entire property. So that's that's pretty awesome. The kitchen's open? Yeah, if you want to go in through the back door um, and just go in there, there's a case that's sitting there. Um, with some of the other Is there a um, it was mentioned that he came back he came back to visit his mother's grave. Have you found graves? You know, we haven't and we are aware that it's here or potentially here, but some of the graves were close to the house and some of them were far away. There's no yeah. pattern. So if he was far away, it's on the been in and not told. No one told us. But it is potentially here because we own we currently own this property and the next two properties actually so it could be on those properties because pretty much once you get under this the sod it's it's it has been undisturbed so you're back in the 19th century so uh, at least on these, this area clearly in the houses that have been developed that's not true anymore so yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day we'll find her and clearly the, we'll preserve her. Are there other digs in Montgomery County? Uh, yeah. That era? So there are other digs. Um, there, are, there aren't always digs going on at the same time. For example, Montgomery College has some digs. Uh, they have an, an anthropology department. They have their professors in summer excavate. Um, and there's some independent folks who dig. Um, um, up in Brookville, there's a dig right now at the, at the Riggs family site. Um, so yeah, there are other digs, but this for Montgomery County Parks, this is our main, this is our main site. Because we want, this is going to be a museum, and we want to be able to tell the best story of his life. So we're, that's why we're doing it so intently right now. So yeah, that's about it. So feel free to hang out, talk to the archaeologists. Mm -hmm. You can go visit them or go see the artifacts. Uh, and I'll walk over. Oh, and I'll look. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I do appreciate you oh. here. So I'm going to close out the scope, you guys. Thank you so much for watching and sharing. Um, and this is the archaeological dig. Thanks for all the hearts. I think this is fascinating. I've never seen an archaeological dig, so this is really cool. Usually you get to a place and they have already excavated everything. But, um, so this, this, is, uh, this is pretty unique. So thanks for joining. Thanks for sharing. See you guys later. Catch Cordelia's scope. She did several of the outside. Cordelia, what's your username now? Okay, Cordelia Gaffar. So look for her, and um, I'm going to share her out too, so you guys can watch her scopes. Thank you. Bye-bye.